I was wondering what is the difference between the yoga that we do on Mondays and the yoga that we are going to do today on Wednesday? When I started doing the Monday classes, <clears throat> uh, this was actually a repeat of a program I did years before, even before I started this breath yoga. And it was part of what I learned from you and what he said, this is Taoist yoga. It was a whole series of exercises uh, with as a general idea to enhance the quality of my, my physique, right? And uh, it was meant for everybody who practices this kind of yoga that you uh, basically play with your body, like you would play with your fingers with a toy in it or something like this, right? And that you become more aware of all the different body parts, how they function, and how you can uh, use them better. So it's a sort of a fine-tuning instrument, you can say. You can figure out with the exercises very gradually, like, oh, but I can also do this, I can also do that, I can go further this way, that way. And as a result of that, you gradually get to have a better understanding of the functions of the different body parts, the external body parts. It's different than Prince. And for this, we have to ask ourselves a few questions. So, we're on fitness when we do the mood on fitness. Or in fitness, we have a program where we actually control the breath and the activities of the body as a general thing. Of course, we enhance the quality of our body within a, a certain kind of mobility, which in a way goes a few steps further than the play yoga. We uh, must, uh, must also be aware of that. But you can say it's also like a yoga where we are improving on the quality of our body, uh, but the, we, we improve in other parts. The play yoga is in that sense is more like a yeah, strength enhancer maybe, but also more flexibility enhancer, enhance the rotations, your balance, everything a little bit, right? That's why it's called play yoga. It shouldn't go too far, so it shouldn't go too radical. But in the breath yoga, when you compare the two, you are really busy, how do you say that, uh, through your breathing, you are busy to change the nature of your being right so in a way it goes way further than uh what we do in the play yoga and the play the play yoga is more like a practicing yourself while the breath yoga is more like a building a joshua point two right and uh <clears throat> or chris point two of course we're not all building a josh point two but uh, depends on whose name you can use and at the moment when you do that, uh, you go through a step-by-step -step process, which is relatively fixed, actually quite fixed. There is a flexibility in it, but you really go through a fixed program. And the, the Chinese word used for it is a tuna practice or Taoian practice. And yoga as a word in Chinese is relatively new. Um, but uh, the main difference with the play yoga is that the breath yoga is not playful at all. Even when you do exercises, like movement exercises to enhance particular kind of quality of your body, they're intentional. Everything is very intentional. You want to achieve this quality because of that purpose. You want to achieve this quality because of that purpose. And that is, that is what Tao Yin does. It wants, every Tao Yin wants you to do a particular thing. Like the Tao Yin in the Qigong, every practice has a particular kind of purpose. And when you string them and they become like a Qigong, right? And at that moment, they have a particular kind of other purpose. Like when we do the Bamboo Formula Qigong, it is a Qigong because the exercises are stringed. And because of the stringing, actually, this is the exercise. But the individual movements, like in the Tsumu Qigong, they are Tao Yin because every exercise in itself has its own uh, conclave of meanings concepts, uh, purposes, and so on and so on. In the case of Tsumu Chikung, actually the Tsumu Chikung is like a doorway going into different directions. And especially when we go to the Tsumu Chikung two part, that's the part where we have gone past the Jing Chi exercise and we go to the uh, uh, Shen Chi exercises. And at that moment, 
we are going to integrate the link body practices more inside the practices. And then we have to uh, open ourselves up to the different creation myths of Taoism so that we start developing a more cosmological consciousness of uh, what we could be, right? So then we start integrating ourselves into a larger scope. This is not present in the, the breath yoga. Daoyin. The breath yoga Daoyin and the Tsumuchiku, they have different purposes. The Tsumuchiku Daoyin is besides strengthening your chi, your uh, awareness and your uh, coherence and developing a foundation for development of chi, like a Tai Chi Chen. Uh, especially the second part, you work towards uh, this a priestly training, so to say. So as a priest, you are involved in all kinds of rituals, and you are doing that within a particular kind of cosmological context, and uh, so much kind of prepares you for that, right? And so this is what is special about that. But in the in the breath yoga, it is relatively abstract. The, the, the Tao Yin, they want to uh, develop step by step a particular kind of progression towards immortality but they remain relatively abstract. It is typical for the Ming Dynasty. In the Ming Dynasty, uh, people were going more towards sort of scientific process based on some tantric Buddhist practices. And uh, you see that the self-experience towards personal transformation and enlightenment and so on uh, starts playing a role. And in the Chong which starts uh, from the Song Dynasty, maybe even some parts from the Tang Dynasty, I'm not sure about that. Uh, even though it's said it's going back all the way to Shannon, which uh, of course uh, is relevant for our dream too. Um, but uh, <coughs> we see in the Tsumuchikung that you go uh, through a more story, story-based development, while in the, in the, the breath yoga you go more in a event-based uh, development, while in the play yoga you are the event, right? So you could you could probably describe these things best that way. And if you then compare the Wudang yoga, the play yoga, the Wudang fitness, and you would uh, see the Wudang breath yoga, and you would see the Tsumuchikum, you see that they basically are a successive line of uh, things that every time show a different relationship from you and the world around you and inside where maybe the Tsumuchiku goes the most far in its uh, intentions and the Udang breath yoga is then a little bit before that you know, where you uh, prepare yourself in another kind of setting while the uh, play yoga and the Udang fitness and they seem to be related to a different kind of scale but the play yoga is more like anybody can do that, right? But the Wudang breath yoga really has as a purpose already to enhance a particular kind of uh, stamina in life in general, which is not necessarily the intention of the Wudang play yoga, although you get a better stamina. But uh, it, it doesn't string things together, but in Wudang fitness, we definitely string things together. And uh, as a result that you get a more overall understanding of your mobility processes. Even if you do the Wudang Fitness 2 or the Wudang Fitness 3, these all have to do with your mobility, while the Wudang Play has more to do with your ability. In a sense that uh, the way how you can rotate your shoulders or your arms or sit straight, or, you know, that you can have the pre proper preparation to be able to do all these kinds. So, if you would sequence them in a day, yeah. Yeah, you would say, okay, we start in the morning with uh, play yoga, <laughs> then a little fitness, uh, then the breath yoga, and then the tsumuchiku, and then enlightenment. Yeah, something like this. I think Taoists call it like that, immortality or something like this. Yes? Um, <clears throat> there is a sort of, I think the breath yoga and the Tsumuchikung, they have a different history, so they also have different kind of techniques. They overlap in some senses, uh, but uh, you see that the Tsumuchikung is clearly rooted in uh, Thunder Fist magic, in Thunder magic in uh, Taoism, in the uh, Tsumu cult. 
while the breath yoga is part of the Chengdu cult, specifically for the Ming night, while the the Chengdu school is more related to the uh, Chengdu cult from before the Ming night. I thought there's a there's a little bit of a difference in there. Um, well, in, in the running course of my practice, of course, I collected as much information as I could because most teachers, they don't really tell you that much about what you're learning and why it is like that. Um, but fortunately, Liu has put the so much going in context to other practices. So as a result of that, I can review other practices that I've learned later uh, within that context, like the breath yoga I learned in a later place. And I can really say like, okay, if the so much going does that for me, then this is what the uh, breath yoga contributes to that process, right? And if I see what the breath yoga for me does for me, I can see the wooden fitness uh, does that for me. It is not the same. So compared to the uh, the tumuchiko, the breath yoga is more simple. You can say, but before the breath yoga, you can say or uh, the wooden fitness is more like a play, right? where you have a relatively informal setting to achieve a particular kind of goal. Uh, while the play yoga actually is not necessarily directed towards a goal, but just has as a purpose a general general um, enhancement. Yes, does that answer your question a little bit? Yes, very much so. Uh, thank you for giving me uh, uh, an overview like that. Thank you. Where, where would the yeah. I think that's helpful. That's why I thought like, okay, what? Where would the, you, you gave like a, a sequence of, of things to do in a day. Well, where would the Tai Chi fit in with that, for instance? Now at that moment, uh, this moment we start to become really like a discussion group today. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so I hope you don't mind that uh, maybe practice is not going to be priority in our list uh, for today. But, um, when you look at the uh, Tai Chi Chuan, uh, <coughs> Tai Chi Chuan in Taoism actually doesn't have that much function. You're, you're muted, uh, Rene. So, what about this thing? You hear me now? Yeah. Okay, because there was somebody calling. So that's why. I think it has to do with my appointment for tomorrow. So maybe I cannot uh, get away and come tomorrow. Right now. And, uh, <coughs> anyway, uh, when. Uh, what was I? Oh, yeah, Tai Chi Chuan. Uh, you, you can say that the experience of seeking Tao is seen as a layered event. And uh, it's so much cool brings you to these kind of events in a storyline fashion. And Tai Chi Chuan is uh, similar like like other Qigongs, yeah, but in an asymmetrical way, it's trying to string some things together to create a particular kind of experience. So Tai Chi Chuan individual moves, they're good for martial arts or uh, maybe as a Wudong fitness or as a yoga or something like this, but they don't have individual meanings, even though the storyline sometimes can be like that. And there are some aspects of uh, Taoist and Tai Chi Chuan, which is different from you know, family Tai Chi Chuan because they're more like a tantric practice. Uh, like when you do the, uh, when you do the, the Longman Tai Chi Chuan, there are many different kind of gods are incorporated in it. So yeah, if you have done the tantric practices, then you can see that in this practice, you also go through the embodiment of all these gods, and so you practice meditation from one move to the next, and you go through a whole tantra. Um, like in the Udang Tai Chi that we are now currently doing, uh, you make all these moves and stuff like this, it's more like about understanding how this notion of water, how it relates to the tantra, and how from there you develop jin. Uh, so it is relatively functional, you can say. But when you look at the different layers on your pathway to Tao, you see that Tai Chi Chuan is like the most superficial training. And so from the superficial training of Tai Chi, where you learn to polarize, you go to the Tai Yi practice. 
most people they do either Tai Chi practice or they do Tai Chi practice or maybe they do them next to each other but they don't see the connection between them because they don't learn them but in this Taoist context they only learn different forms so they don't understand what is the difference between these practices so then the moment you have done Tai Chi Chuan then because of having done Tai Chi Chuan you transform your Tai Chi Chuan to Tai Chi Chuan in the sense that you go from Tai Chi polarization or to Tai Chi unity right and then your movements create a particular kind of unity which is different uh, from uh, Tai Chi example let me see Tai Chi Chuan for instance you polarize and you know you, you develop this kind of movement but in Tai Chi movement will be very different because then at that moment This would not actually be the case, but it, you will much more take it apart and make the move, uh, create a particular kind of unity. So the unity is the goal of the movement. Uh, it's more than that. It's this is just a superficial uh, introduction of the idea, of course, uh, right? Then, when you have done the Tai practice, you go towards the Tai He practice, which is both indicating harmony but also like being like a crane that means that you basically start letting go of the connectedness to the world in your practice at the moment when you do Tai Chi you seem to be very aloof and outside and more like a flying this is where the white crane boxing also is based upon right so it goes back to these kind of things although in white crane boxing like Wing Chun and so on karate everything has become uh, simplified so uh, how do you say um well secular secular you should say right and uh from there you go to tai shu where you actually start enhancing the weakness of your body system so you basically you transform from the strong polarity based thing you go to a weaker state where you create gradually uh how do you say um where the boundaries between being alive and death becomes more vague. So it doesn't have much meaning if you don't go to the trans uh, the transformation process of the right? So you have to go to the priest process to create that process in the Chen also, because otherwise they're just different forms. Mm -hmm. And eventually then you have to end up in the unity with Tao. Of course, uh, there's a few more steps, but in the Tsumuchiko, you, uh, you do not only have the Tao Yin as a movement, but there's also a whole series of meditations that connect with that. And as a result of these connections, like with the link body meditation, the energy meditation, the Dante meditation, the uh, organ massages, the, the, and the communication with the spirit of the body, communication with the spirit of plants, mountains, clouds. Um, uh, uh, traveling outside of your body, communication with gods, and uh, visiting heavenly mansions, uh, getting yourself unwritten from the book of the, de the living, and uh, unwritten from the book of the death. That means that you don't go to hell, but you come into a sort of a limbo existence where you have the opportunity to develop your immortality. And so then, so there's a lot of different types of stages you have to go through and travel through and you have everywhere you have like a drop off where you can go into a more secular material version so you can make it into a commercial thing if you want like for instance in the link body practice there's a particular level where you have to uh, get out of your own link body nature and you have to connect with other link power uh, link body and uh, nature from other people so that you start getting more understanding of other people's life and how life lives interact with each other in a particular kind of way but then you also start noticing from there another practice where you go look into past lives future lives and possible lives and so on and so forth so all these kind of things are all storylines that help you develop particular kind of things so you can see that the tight trend plays a role in there right um to help you root more deep in the different layers that you have to go through in your transformation process. Yes? <laughs> so it's scary, right? For this whole pathway. If you want to run this whole pathway, it's a long way. <laughs> 
That's why I say you have to give up your work and you have to give up your wife and your girlfriends and whatever kind of things. Family, it's the only way. <laughs> because it only sets you back. So that's the truth. That's my, all my teachers, they agreed about that. And they said, like, oh, it's something you can choose, but it sets you back. Because it's difficult to maintain that kind of discipline. You don't lose the awareness, but it uh, requires a particular kind of discipline that you have to keep up with. So throughout the whole year, you go through a whole year of development of your exercises. Like you do a particular ritual only once a year, right? For a simple reason that if you have to do it every day, it makes no sense. But if you do it once a year, it's okay. There's some rituals you do every day. If you don't do them every day, at least you have to do them here. Right? So that's it. <coughs> yes? Is that clear? Yeah. But then you can see that uh, this whole thing of classification of exercise this is very difficult. And this is also why you see that in uh, Taoism, they emphasize the three treasures, the, the classics, the school, and the teacher, right? So these are the three treasures. And the reason why the classics are treasures, of course, is by itself because the text, they give general explanation from different masters and different traditions, different schools, and they emphasize the trajectory for particular kind of uh, directions, like in the, in the, the Ling Bao practice or the Shantzing practice or the Tao Te practice and so on and so forth, right? So these three uh, treasures or cavities, basically the three cavities of the, of the classics, uh, they emphasize the relationship with the three major gods involved in the creation of the world after uh, Tao, right? So that's most close to, uh, to our reality compared to Tao. Then when uh, you uh, go look deeper, you go look at the school, you see that the schools have uh, emphasized a particular kind of thing. So the classics discusses all three layers, but the school always makes a choice for one particular layer, right? And that particular layer is being worked out and so on and so on. Uh, in uh, all its uh, uh, ways that is possible. Please be careful with my cable. Oh, stepping over my cable. Before I know it, I'm locked out. Anyway, when they, when they go, when the school goes to that, and it depends on the development of the school as a whole, how much of that is being put in ta inside the program. Like for instance, if I would be, like to be like a completely official school, I have to implement a ritual program, I have to implement dress code, I have to implement uh, all kinds of activities besides the training in itself. If I only do the training, like what I do right now in the medicine part, then at that moment, uh, you're doing all the Taoist things that you need on a personal level, but uh, the other levels are necessary because this is how the three treasures basically prescribe it uh, to, be, to be doing it like that. You have to have the right kind of premises and uh, you have to make sure that uh, all the students go through uh, uh, official oaths and so on and so on. Yeah, because they have to really dedicate themselves to their studies. Then at the moment when you go to the third treasure, the teacher, that's the individual interpretation of the individual teachers. And in my case, because it's a small school, the interpretation of the school and the interpretation of the teacher is you know, overlapping to such a significant degree that sometimes the difference is not really very visible. Uh, because the school has a particular direction set out and I don't know much more than the school does. So. <laughs> Right? So then sometimes I might think like, okay, well, this is how my teacher tell me, but you know, this is my thoughts. So then at that moment it becomes the teacher, right? So that's the difference. So that means that if a school becomes bigger and there's more teachers and individual teachers input is much bigger. Like for instance, if we would grow as a Taoist program and it would really become famous as a Taoist uh, school, serious uh, school, then at a certain point, because uh, Chris is teaching and uh, Joshua is quick teaching, everybody else is teaching. At some point, then your individual voices, they are like the flavors of the, of the teachings, right? So but then Joshua says like, well, my experience is like this and this, blah, 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 blah. I think it's like this and this. That's the flavor. At the moment, when somebody is being trained to 
become part of that group. They learn the school curriculum and they uh, learn the individual curriculum that they have themselves, that they develop themselves as a result of it. But once they start contributing to the development of the school as a whole, then they automatically have to fall back to the school curriculum. The classics always remain the same, right? Then uh, this school curriculum, but also the teacher curriculum, always has to do with the individual input from exercises. And for instance, uh, throughout Taoism, even though people were all part of the same school, they didn't always learn exactly the same exercises. Some people took some things from Shaolin, some people from the army, some things they just come up in their mind as a, like a spontaneous revelation or something like this. So then that adds gradually over time to the insights of the, of the, of the, of the program. And some of these things, they make it into the school program and some things they stay with the individual teacher. As, as a headmaster, on, on the other hand, I think, yeah, you're more or less obliged to just represent the school, the school principles and the classics. You, you don't have much right to have your own individual opinion, sometimes. And a, I think as a headmaster, you have less freedoms than as an individual teacher. Uh, same way as a student, you have all the freedoms you want, right? Although in the oath that you take, if you would take an oath, you are obliged to always uh, give absolute obeisance to the wishes of the teacher or the master or something like that. So they say, even though you're on the other side of the planet, they say like, I need you to be here next week, you should need to do that and that. Officially, you're supposed to do that. Uh, of course, it is into the nature of the teacher, if they have abused that thing. Usually they only do that when they want to throw you out. <laughs> because they know that you can't do that, so... <clears throat> then they use it as a threat. <clears throat> Teachers are crazy creatures sometimes. Now they have their agenda, I mean, they, they have to manifest the school in a better way. Like for instance, if I would have like official school building, the school building eventually gradually has to turn into a temple. The temple eventually has to grow into a monastery. And so, that's, so that is the natural development of the school. Uh, but the more official that becomes, the more you also become integrated with all the other institutions. So my first goal now is like to start a European foundation so that we can have official recognition in both Malaysia and in uh, Singapore, I think it is, Malaysia and in Beijing as a Taoist Institute, so that our program can be recognized. They can recognize the program in what I do because they're interested in it, but uh, your official registration, you need particular kind of paper so that everything has to become very official. And for me, for instance, it means that I have to change my passport name in my Taoist name. So these are all consequences of these steps. And because you're supposed to give up your old life. Yeah. So it's all pretty serious, of course. And it has all has to do with this transformation towards this immortality thing. And since I still have some 900 something years, yeah, thousand years, I think for now, I, I can take my time. Yes? Okay, so in relationship to training, you see this Taiji Chuan then connects with that. But you see as a whole, the whole training sequence from beginner, like when you are just starting as a help builder, for instance, towards you know, the end point is a very long trajectory. Mm -hmm. There's so many ways to drop out of that system. Nobody's ever going to blame anybody for not going the whole line. Usually there's in every generation, there's only a few people who really form the whole line. So uh, that is why they very often say that Taoism is very elitist, because it knows that um, it's a hard way to complete. Uh, there's many ways. You can still be loyal to everything that you learn without ever coming to completion. 
you might still become an immortal. Who knows? You don't think passes by, gives you a pill, whacks you on the head, says, eat this pill and do not die. <laughs> Something like this. Yeah. Right? Uh, say hi. <laughs> The, the bird is gone, by the way. So they're happy. <laughs> they get all the attention again. Okay, any question left on that? No questions? You want some cooking oil for drinking? Old one. All right, any other questions left by accident? Or should I just close this session for recording? Any thoughts on the blue one? Another one, you also do another one then. Yeah. <laughs> How long do I stand here?